much for the invitation to speak. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be part of this mini symposium. So I will change gears a little bit, not terribly much, to talk about RNA viruses. Um, in the past decade, if you think about it, RNA biology is an area for infectious diseases which has been really greatly explored and has resulted in new knowledge on the role of RNAs, microRNAs, uh, siRNAs, and the development and progression of several diseases. Um, but what we are really interested in is the knowledge of RNA function in disease related to its structural determinants and also due to RNA protein interactions that influence viral infection and pathogenesis. And one of our favorite viruses is human parechovirus, which is shown here with a neutralizing antibody. I'm not gonna talk much about that today, um, but I like the picture. So, Although currently we may feel like there is only one virus on Earth, uh, there are many more. Roger Hendricks estimated that there were 10 to the power of 31 viruses on Earth, and which if you stretch them end to end would actually stretch 10 million light years. So if we consider that we are now paralyzed by uh, coronavirus, then there's a lot more out there. So what about picornaviruses? Well, so picornaviruses are going to be the subject of my talk today. These picornaviruses are very simple RNA viruses. They just have small RNA genome with a protein coat. And they include rhinoviruses and enteroviruses. Rhinoviruses cause millions of cases of upper respiratory infections yearly and they also contribute to asthma. Enteroviruses are responsible for meningitis, encephalitis, polio, to mention just a few of my favorite diseases. Um, the, there are currently no antivirals that can be used for the treatment or prevention of these rhino or enteroviruses, and very few vaccines are available. If we take a schematic look at a typical picornavirus, life cycle, there's just a couple of places I want you to concentrate on from the schematic diagram. So one is what happens on entry. So these viruses are going to attach via either an attachment receptor or uh, a bona fide receptor to the cell membrane, and then they're going to be endocytosed. And during the process of endocytosis, they're going to end up in the endosome, Late endosomal compartment, and depending on the picornavirus, they may uncoat due to a change of pH and interaction with the receptor, or then they may uncoat due to other changes that occur in the endosome, with the result that the RNA genome will be released into the cytoplasm where it can then do its stuff. And then after making the new copies of the genome, assembling the proteins. What we see is assembly of the RNA and the capsid proteins together to create the full virion, and then we get released usually through lysis. So I'm going to tell you very, very briefly about some work we did a few years ago on this assembly with the RNA, but I'm mainly going to focus on uh, a few different molecules that we've now identified which help to interfere in this process of RNA uncoating. And obviously, if you pre prevent the uncoating of the genome, you can prevent infection. If you can prevent assembly, you can also prevent infection. So this is the story about RNA, which is why I was so interested in uh, Yuri's beautiful assembly work earlier. So we discovered a few years ago when we were looking at human parechovirus that the genome is incredibly well organized. This is the protein on the outside. All the rest that you see here is RNA. And we can see at least 20% of the genomes ordered in these structures. And what we noticed was a very specific interaction occurring 
in between the capsid and the RNA to the extent that we could actually model quite a lot of the RNA in these sites. Now, with icosahedral symmetry, it's difficult to then pull out what is the sequence of this, but using combination of selix and mutational studies, we were able to identify that there are many sites throughout the whole genome which can adopt this particular fold. And this particular fold then is important in driving the co-assembly of human parechovirus. Our collaborators, so this is especially with uh, Peter Stockley and Raiden Twarok, have been looking at other viruses which also have these distributed packaging signals throughout the genome. They have discovered them in hepatitis B virus, which is why I was asking Yuri about this, because there are, you can knock out something like four or five of these and you can prevent assembly in cells. Um, it's also, these are also present in alpha viruses as well. And uh, Peter just has a paper that came out over, or it's in press at the moment, um, on enteroviruses. Uh, he's also found these packaging signals present in enteroviruses. Now, when you have just a single protein making up the capsid, it's possible to then interfere with the capsid pockets that are being produced during assembly to actually prevent the RNA protein interaction. And therefore you can actually target this as an antiviral um, target. You can target the RNA, you can target the, the protein pocket, and Peter showed really nicely how you could do that for hepatitis B. In terms of parechovirus, the pocket that is made is really complicated in terms of the number of protein copies that contribute to it and the interaction of those proteins. So for instance, to make this pocket, uh, there's a there's a terminus which is coming from a fivefold which is over here another terminus coming from fivefold over here and so these are very long range interactions to form the pocket it's highly unlikely that this pocket forms first and then there is an interaction with the rna it's likely that the pocket is um, only fully formed once you get something like 15 different proteins together and so although I, we thought it was a really good target, I actually have since decided that maybe not for parechoviruses. Okay, so what else can we target? As I said, one of the things to think about is the uncoating of the genome. Now, it was known, it's been known for many years for um, enteroviruses that if you heat them up to 50 degrees or you um, put them into very extreme non-physiological conditions, then they will release the genome. And what you see is that the particles are, when they are infectious, they are in a compact form. And as they get ready to release the RNA, they will expand, the capsimers will rotate, and you have these pores which are formed, for instance, here illustrated in the twofold axis where the RNA can come out. You also get pores coming all the way up here as well, so there's also threefold. So what we realized um, with Barbo Marumaki uh, was that in fact there is an expanded state of these enterovirus particles which still has the RNA inside but it's prime so you've got a metastable state, you've expanded the particle, the RNA is waiting to be released. And we found physiological conditions under which this could actually occur. So there are two things that you can do. One is to consider what are the typical sort of ion concentrations that one has outside the cell, and then how do they change in terms of the maturation of the endosome? And we know that these particular enteroviruses, so we're talking about uh, Coxsackie virus B3, uh, Coxsackie virus A9, we know that these are not sensitive to the pH of the endosome, so we're not looking at the changes in hydrogen ion concentration, but it's more a change in the sodium 
and the potassium levels as you have maturation of the endosome that actually have this effect. So basically we could put the virus into conditions which emulate the iron concentrations of the endosome with respect to sodium or potassium, and then we could cause this expansion to occur, but the virus particles were still infectious. Another surprising result was that we could remove the fatty acids, which are normally found inside these viral capsids, um, by exposing them to albumin. You know, albumin's present in the circulation, and it's a very good binder for fatty acids. And these capsids are very sensitive to the removal of the fatty acids, and they also expand when that occurs. So, in a serendipitous parallel study, we were working with our collaborators, Johan Nutz in the Rega Institute in Leuven, Belgium, and they had developed a, what was meant to be a protease inhibitor um, based on um, the structure of proteases from viruses that they're interested in, turned out that the molecule that they had designed was not actually a protease inhibitor, but it was really good at inhibiting enteroviruses. And I will give you the spoiler alert now. Basically, they'd found serendipitously a molecule which bound to the enterovirus capsid, but not to where capsid inhibitors normally bind to in the coronaviruses. So the most common capsid inhibitors that we know of, these were developed um, on the back of work by Michael Rossman starting in 1994, um, where he recognized the normal occupancy within this pocket in the, uh, the so-called VP1 protein of these viruses, that there's normally a lipid factor bound here, very often it's palmitate, which is bound. And when you do this expansion of the capsid, then this pocket gets squashed and the lipid factor is also removed. Now, what Johann's group did was to take a mutant of Coxsackie virus B3 called the Nancy strain, which through uh, isoleucine leucine mutation no longer binds fatty acids into this pocket. And we, we also showed this then by EM that this was indeed the case. And they found that the small molecule they have found was still effective against this Nancy strain, which meant that the inhibitor didn't bind to the uh, VP1 pocket. Where did it bind? Well, we had a look obviously by cryo to see what it was, but we, why did we look by cryo? We looked because um, what Johan showed was that the molecule shown here on the left is effective against a huge bunch of different Coxsackie viruses, which is interesting. We took the one which was most sensitive to the drug, which is shown here. Um, it's got an EC50 of around 0.7 micromolar against uh, Coxsackie virus B3. And you can also see on this graph on the right, we can see basically the amount of viral RNA, which is produced in cells with increasing amounts of the compound that we're interested in. And this basically shows you that the amount of viral RNA decreases as you have the compound present. So obviously you're having an early effect on the, infect on the infection and that correlates with a decrease in the number of plaques that we see during the infection. So um, what happens if you add pleconeril to a sensitive strain of Coxsackie virus B3 is that pleconeril basically being this thing that will bind to the lipid pocket. In that case, you see that it's a very effective drug really early on in infection. So this is a time of drug addition assay, where if you add the prior uh, to the cells prior to infection, then they are protected. But if you add it after infection, they are not protected. And the compound 17, 
that we were looking at now mirrored this effect, which also says that it happens very early on in infection, most likely it's binding to capsid. In contrast here, you see a polymerase inhibitor, uh, Favipiravir, which then um, is effective also after the virus has attached to the cells. So we did uh, the structure of the Coxsackie B3 in complex with the compound to about 2.8 angstroms. This is with data collected in diamond. And it was possible to resolve the small molecule within this density. Uh, and this was pretty unambiguous as to the orientation of the molecule. Um, and really, it was quite nice to see how it fits into this pocket. But again, interestingly, this pocket is not just made from a single protein, unlike the lipid binding pocket is in fact made from two copies of VP1 and one copy of VP3. So it's sitting at the interface of um, the protomer of the virus. So you've got 60 protomers that make up the capsid structure and this sits at the interface between two. Um, so what we did to show that this really was the binding pocket was then to isolate a number of mutants to see whether or not these could confer resistance by interfering with the presumed interactions. And they, these either did confer resistance or then they actually were not recoverable mutants, so they were non-viable, which suggests that this is a critical area in terms of the virus um, assembly. So if we take a look at these two different um, pockets, which you can target on enteroviruses. So here is uh, the famous protein that I was talking about, made up of these three different capsid proteins. And this is the fatty acid that binds into the VP1 pocket. So this is the site for clonal activity. And then the compound 17 is sitting up here on the edge of the protomer. You see it's a completely distinct site to the, the gonorrhoal. And in fact, when one does a synergy study between the two drugs in a sensitive strain, then indeed these two compounds are synergistic. And why does it work? Well, it, it interferes with the rearrangements that facilitate the activation of the particle for RNA release. And so what Johan then, then did was to do comprehensive screen of 62 analogs against seven, uh, 12 different strains of entero and rhinoviruses. And this, heat, this is a heat map basically summarizing all of those results for all these different compounds. And you can see that there are some compounds such as this compound 48, which actually is effective against a large number of enteroviruses. And there are also a few hits for rhinoviruses as well. And um, what we decided to do next was to then look at some of these other compounds and the compound 48, which is the broadest range compound that we found. We decided to look at whether or not that was indeed really binding to the same pocket. Uh, so compound 48 stabilized the capsid. This goes along with our uh, hypothesis of the mechanism of action. And so this basically shows you as you treat the virus at higher and higher temperature um, for a limited amount of time in the presence or the absence of the drug, then throw it on cells and see if it's still live. Um, you can see that the virus on its own is still active up to 46 degrees, but it's no longer viable at 49 degrees, whereas in the presence of this compound 48, it's actually viable even to 52 degrees. And so it's really helping to stabilize the and protect the virus. Um, so the structure of Coxsackie virus B4 hadn't been solved previously. So these are data collected at Sinai Lab in Stockholm. Um, 
to 2.7 isomers resolution where we can easily resolve actually all four of the capsid proteins. And we could see also the position of the drug. This is just a quick movie to show you how it also sits. And we've used the same colors here. So you can see that, again, the pocket is made up of two copies of VP1, one copy of VP3, and the drug sits in exactly the same pocket, which was reassuring. Um, and this is just a comparison between the uh, CVB4 wild type virus and then the CVB4 with the compound in it. So you can see that it doesn't cause major re uh, re rearrangement of this pocket on the surface. So this pocket is indeed conserved across many different enteroviruses and also rhinoviruses. And so um, it's primarily, primarily these three residues which are holding the drug in place, but then there are a couple of other residues which are also important in defining the, the pocket as well. And so what we're looking at now are some of the more remote rhinovirus uh, structures to see whether or not uh, we can also target this pocket in those as well. Uh, so to conclude, we've identified uh, three conserved residues to our, uh, in the interprotein pocket of enteroviruses, which can be utilized by both of these inhibitors. Interestingly, um, Tibalt et al. looked into the role of glutathione in encouraging the assembly of enteroviruses back in 2014. And uh, they showed, they didn't show that this pocket was important, but there were indications that perhaps it was a location close to this based on mutational studies. And then there's a nice study also from Dave Stewart's lab last year where they supersaturated um, a bovine enterovirus with glutathione in the assembled capsid, and they could show that this uh, binding pocket that we've identified is also a place where you can bind glutathione in the strain of virus that they were using. Although we have never seen any evidence of uh, a cofactor being bound in our purified viruses. Um, the reason that these inhibitors work is that they prevent conformational changes which are needed for particle expansion and for infectivity. And finally, I would like to thank lots of people, obviously, a uh, great team in Johan's lab. Uh, in my lab, James was working on the CBB3 structure. Uh, Benita and Fassi have done majority of the microscopy in our lab. And then Justin and Aushra were working on the structures of the CVB4. And Alma Seppola has been is a great master's student who's been doing movies for me. Uh, and then I want to also thank uh, Marta at SciLab Sci Lab for the new CVB4 data, Bartle's lab for the studies on the uh, roles of ions and albumin in enteroviral infection and you for your attention. Thank you.